Where's your fishing pal, Johnny? Oh, he forgot to pick up a service bulletin for Murphy. He'll be right along. He'd better be, Larry. We've got a lot of ground to cover. While we're waiting, let's talk about this new carburetor that's used on the DeSoto V8 engine. You mean that small, compact job, Murph? Yeah, Larry. This carburetor is a lot shorter than the one we've been using and has quite a few design improvements. However... Hey, Murph, this the bulletin you wanted? Yeah, John, and you timed it just right. I was just going to tell Larry about the carburetor correction this service bulletin covers. Is that the correction for the accelerator pump system? Right, Tech. You see, fellas, you might get an occasional report of a stumble or hesitation during acceleration. So, if you're road testing a car, and you notice the stumble when the engine gets up to normal operating temperature, keep checking the performance on acceleration. As the engine gets hotter, the condition might become more noticeable. In fact, the engine might even stall. So on this car, I'd like to show you the correction this bulletin talks about. It sounds a lot like vapor lock to me, Murph. That's what it is in a way. There's probably an air pocket somewhere in the accelerator pump system. We can correct it without removing the carburetor. Uh, where do you begin, Murph? First, you take the air horn off the carburetor. But take it easy when you remove that air horn, me boys. And here's why. The spring under the step-up piston might pop the piston out of the main body. If you lift the air horn carefully, that won't happen and you won't damage the step-up rods. Okay, we'll watch that. Fine. Now, to correct the condition, we have to remove the three steel check balls and put in aluminum balls. Also, we throw away the two check ball retainers. In addition, we discard the pump plunger and replace it with a new, longer one. So remove the old plunger, and with needle nose pliers or this special tool, Remove the intake check ball retainer from the bottom of the pump cylinder. Place a cloth over the carburetor to keep the parts from flying out or falling into the manifold. Then blow air into the pump cylinder. That'll bring out the two check balls and retainers in the discharge passages. Then blow air through one of the discharge passages to get the intake check ball out. You want to be careful when you're doing that so you won't get a face full of gas or chips. Right. Now install these new aluminum check valves in the discharge passages. In addition, use the spring from under the step-up piston as a funnel to install an aluminum check valve in the bottom of the pump cylinder. The spring helps guide the ball in place. Then, use this tool to install the intake check valve retainer and secure it in place. Instead of the former pump plunger, install this new one. The shaft is 3 sixteenths of an inch longer and has two holes near the top. It makes the plunger bottom sooner and provides a better stroke. Use this wire retainer to hold down the step-up piston. Incidentally, you better tighten the Venturi attaching screws and especially the step-up piston passage screw. That'll prevent any air leak. Tex right. You have to use an offset screwdriver to tighten that passage screw. Then install the air horn. Now, Reconnect the choke heat tube and the wires to the dash pot and the kickdown switch. Finally, connect the pump arm to the upper hole of the shaft. Install the end of the connector rod in the outer or long stroke hole of the throttle shaft arm. I get you. That about cover correcting the stumble on acceleration? Well, practically. When you've finished connecting the pump rod, you should check the pump plunger adjustment. Here's how. First, Back off the idle speed screw to completely close the throttle valves. Make sure the choke valve is wide open. Then, holding the throttle tightly closed, use a scale to see if the top of the pump plunger is exactly 57 60 fourths of an inch above the bowl cover. If necessary, use the bending tool to bend the pump connector rod to get this measurement right. When you set idle speed, Warm up the engine to open the choke valve wide. Put the gear shift in neutral and use a tachometer to set the engine free idle speed between 475 and 500 RPM. Final setting of the idle mixture screws should be between three quarters and one and a quarter turns open. Nice going, Murph. I think John and Larry can get the rest of that story on adjustments out of this reference book. Check and double check, Tech. Now, Murph, 
Why have you got all these transmission parts out on the bench? So we can clear up some questions on unusual transmission conditions, Larry. There are two general things we don't run into very often. For example, a slight clash of gears during shifting, or a little stiffness in gear shift action, where an owner might have to use a little more than normal effort. What could cause that stiffness, Murph? There might be a number of things, John, and running down the exact cause could chew up a lot of time. So, I think we'd better cover all the friction possibilities completely. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to check the transmission linkage adjustment. No, that's really the place to start. We're not going to cover that now because the story's in the reference book. A stiff action of the gear shift level could be caused by friction in a number of places. So, let's do the easiest thing first. That means removing the gear shift housing to begin with. Then try to move the operating level. If there's a bind in the lever shaft, the seal at the upper end of the shaft might be dry. Or there might be a burr on the shaft at the upper end, next to the groove for the shaft screw. So back out that set screw, remove the shaft, and lubricate the seal with wheel bearing grease. Yes, and when you reinstall the shaft, don't tighten the set screw until after the shaft is installed. Notice that there are two flats in the hole in the lever that made with the flats on the end of the shaft. So, if the lever is driven onto the shaft, the screw might form a burr above the screw groove in the shaft. That could cause the shaft to bind. So, install the lever and then tighten the set screw. How about the selector lever? Well, if you feel a bind or roughness when you try turning the selector lever, Look for sharp edges, roughness, or burrs on the contact surfaces of the selector cam. If you notice any, smooth them off with a fine stone or emery cloth. Remember, the seal on the selector lever might be dry, causing a little drag. But wheel bearing lubricant will take care of the seal too, won't it? Right. Besides that, inspect the cam contact surface on the flat of the lever. Also, examine the fork operating surfaces and the notches in both forks. Dress down these surfaces if necessary. In other words, any contact surface that's rough doesn't mean too much in itself. But all those places added together might cause enough friction to make shifting seem stiff. Atta boy, Murph. That's the main idea. Okay. Now, the shift rails in the case ought to be checked next. So, put a detent ball in the case. Then, with one finger, hold the detent ball in the notch in the rail. That will hold that rail in its neutral position. Now, with your other hand, check the opposite rail for freedom of movement into gear. Repeat this check on the other rail. If there's any binding, the rail may be bent, or the rail holes in the case are burred and need cleaning up. Hey, somebody better turn this record over or this hole is going to be burred and need cleaning up. Remove the shift fork screws next, fellas, and try turning the rails in the case. Yes, if they bind, they're probably bent and ought to be replaced. I suppose you can double check the rails by rolling them tightly against each other or against new rails out of stock. Good idea, Larry. And if there's no space or rocking between the rails, they're okay. The holes in the case are probably burred. Right, Murk. So, fellas, use a half-inch expansion reamer and ream the holes out about three thousandths oversize. Good suggestion, Tech. That reaming will clean up those holes and remove burrs at the same time. How about those shift forks, Murph? They've got a lot of contact surfaces. You're right on the ball, John. Better inspect those fork surfaces closely. If only the ends of the forks have bright spots, the forks are okay. If the contact on one end is light, but heavy on the other, the fork's probably bent. As you fellas know, the fork prongs have to line up so they will fit squarely into the shifting groove of the gear. Otherwise, the gear will cock on its shaft, causing a momentary bind. You can grind off the prong with the heavy contact or replace the fork. Now, if the fork's been making contact anywhere else except on the ends, You'd better grind those bright spots down. What good will that do, Murph? Well, grinding will true up the contact areas so the fork will move the low and reverse gear or the synchronizer shift sleeve smoothly. Okay, that clears it up for me. 
Now, fellas, if you notice some stiffness when shifting from neutral to low or reverse, check the movement of the gear on the main shaft. Just slide the gear back and forth on the main shaft. If it binds, smooth down the splines on the shaft and in the gear. Yes, and here's something else. Inspect the chamfers on the gear teeth. If they're burred or rough, it will cause gear butting, so smooth them down with a small stone. Suppose you notice that the stiffness is in second or high. For stiffness in second or high, examine the synchronizer assembly. The same goes for a report of a slight noise as the gears start to mesh in second or high. Here's what you check. First, there should be an eight to 10 pound pull to move a lubricated synchronizer sleeve from one side of the gear to the other. You can check it with a spring scale rig like this. If it takes more than a 10 pound pull to move the sleeve, check the contact edges of the shifting plates and the end radius on the cone of the main drive pinion and on the cone of the second speed gear. Yeah, and if you spot any polished marks, press down each end radius on the cone and also the ends of the shifting plates. Now, tell them about those shifting plate springs, Murph. Oh, yes. Check those springs for roundness. If the ends of the spring drag on the inside of the gear, the plates won't move out as readily as they should. You can eliminate that drag by bending the ends of the spring in toward the center. Bend them so they'll be about a 32nd of an inch away from the side of the gear. Don't bend them in too much, or they'll bring in gear clashing all the time. Right. Now, check the sides of the shifting plates and the clutch gear slots that the plates move through. If there's any roughness, smooth it down. In addition, Check the inside of the shifting sleeve for burrs in the center groove. That's a possible friction point, too. Of course, the threads in the stop ring have to be good. Yeah, and if they are, but you still hear a slight noise when the gears begin to mesh, here's what you'll have to do. Put the stop ring on the mating cone surface and see if it fits snugly. If you can rock it on the cone as much as ten thousandths, it's too far out around and has to be replaced. Hmm, I see, Murph. An out around stop ring. That's the ticket. And that wraps up my ideas on transmission shifting. Well, you sure gave the boys a lot of help on causes of stiff shifting action and gear noise. That was a mighty complete story. But remember this, fellas. You won't find all these conditions we talked about in any one transmission. Murph and I just wanted to let you in on all the possibilities so you'd know what to look for. Okay, Tech. Thanks. What's next, Murph? Well, we have one more thing to cover. We're going to do more of our own body work in this department from now on. What do you mean, Murph? We do our own bumping and painting now. Yeah, I know. But now we're going to learn to do our own trim work. And we're going to start by learning how a seat cushion is made. I've stripped this cushion down, and now I'm going to show you how to assemble it. First, position the pad support so its rear edge overlaps the rear spring spacer slightly. With hog ring pliers and new rings, fasten it at each corner so there is no slack. Then stagger the other hog rings at front and rear edges so you've got five rings at the rear and four at the front. If you don't hog ring that pad support like that, you'll have a sagging seat. Right. Now turn the spring pad upside down. Invert the spring assembly and put it on the pad about four inches in from the front edge of the pad, three inches in from the ends. Fold the front edge and ring it to the front row of coil springs. Get a good bite of the pad for a firm grip. Hog ring the rear edge of the pad to the openings in the rear cross member. Getting that pad spread smoothly over the springs has a lot to do with having a good, comfortable cushion. Okay, we'll anchor that spring pad right. Well, now, if the rear edge of the pad is thinned out, do this. Take a 52-inch length of wire, about 13 gauge, with eyed ends, and thread it through the edge as a listing wire. Hog ring over that wired edge. Good point, Murph. Now, fellas, be sure to hog ring the spring pad to the side coils and to the braces at the rear corners. That'll keep this pad properly in place and prevent a sagging seat. Yeah, and here's something else. 
Be sure to put trimmer's latex cement along the tapes of the foam rubber pads and fasten them evenly to the center pad. That keeps those pads from separating and causing a low spot between the pillows. On cotton jobs, you won't have to do this. Okay. Then replace the trim and hog ring it securely, huh? Correct. This reference book has more details covering adjustments on all types of seat cushions. Three coil, four coil, cotton or foam rubber padded. Fine. I'm gonna need that book. Don't worry. You'll find seat cushion service a lot easier than you think. That's right, Murph. Now, fellas, all these servicing tips help us do a better job. Actually, they're just little things, but owners consider them big problems. And when you add these service skills to what you already can do, you'll be doing your part to keep those service customers coming back with more business to keep you on the job. Oh, <laughs>